Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I see that we have folks across the globe, so welcome. My name is Lori Manderbach, and I'm a Vice President of Partnerships and Business Development at Vero, and I'm going to be your host and moderator today uh, for this Vero webinar featuring the Hackett Group. The Hackett Group is a leader in business advisory, benchmarking, and transformation services. But before we proceed, I want to first ask everybody, how many of you have actually heard of Vero? I mean, not Vero, the Hackett Group and Vero. <laughs> Funny. So we've posted a poll and you can see the poll right now. You're very familiar, somewhat familiar, not really familiar, not at all. So take a, a few seconds to post your vote. And while you're taking that, that vote, I also want to go over some housekeeping rules next. Okay, all attendees are going to be on listen-only mode, and please feel free to type all your questions in the chat window, and we'll address them um, as we come across the questions. If you are facing any kind of technical issues, please log back in or reach out to us through the chat feature and we'll try to help you. So I see we've got the poll result results in. Wow, I guess over 50% of you have heard of the Hackett Group. Well, I think that's good, Elizabeth. We don't have to do much of an introduction then, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. So the topic for today's discussion is digital world class procurement driving business value. And I am excited to introduce our speakers, Chris Sawcheck and Elizabeth Zucker, both from the Hackett Group. I'll share with you their bios. Chris is a global practice leader with the Hackett Group and has over 20 years experience advising Fortune 500 and mid-sized companies. Chris has provided transformational guidance and strategy and organizational change to significantly improve the supply management capabilities of his clients. His background includes engineering, operations, and sales roles with several Fortune 500 companies. He holds a bachelor's degree, an MBA, and is currently pursuing his doctorate in business administration. Chris, uh, Chris and Elizabeth work together. Elizabeth is a senior advisor. She's responsible for delivering insights on best practices and performance metrics uh, to procurement leaders. And she's held several executive procurement roles. She brings a very unique blend of practitioner from the procurement side and advisory experience to her role. During her 20 plus year career in procurement, she's managed sourcing organizations, led global category teams, and helped companies to stand up supplier relationship management category management and strategic sourcing frameworks. She serves on the CPO Advisory Council of ISM. She's authored many articles and she's a frequent speaker at professional events. And she's also on the faculty of SIG University. She holds an MBA from Georgetown University and a Bachelor of Administration from Wellesley College. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth. Elizabeth? Did we lose Elizabeth? We might have lost Elizabeth. Oh. Hmm. It says we can't see the slides. All right, give us folks some, a moment um, while we get Elizabeth back online. She has the presentation. All right, you're on mute. <laughs> I'm back. I do not know what happened, so I apologize. I was told I was kicked out of the webinar, but I'm sure that is not the case. <laughs> so I just introduced you, Elizabeth. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you. <laughs> yes, now that we've made sure that everyone's paying attention. Um, hey, good, good morning. Good afternoon. Yes. 
<laughs> what was that? <laughs> so uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are. So glad to be here with Lori and the team from Barreau. Chris and I are gonna spend some time talking about uh, Hackett's definition of what the top performance looks like in procurement and hopefully give you some good insights and guidance on how these top procurement organizations are looking at um, their performance, their, the value they're contributing to their organizations. So um, one of the important uh, things we want to start with is what, uh, Hackett has designated top performance um, as what we call digital world class performance. And so I wanted to sh I want to show you here the Hackett value grid. Um, and what you'll see is that uh, we look at performance across two critical measure areas. The first is business value. And business value consists of things like, uh, st consists of stakeholder experience. So the experience that uh, procurement organizations are creating for um, our internal stakeholders uh, as they go through and working with us in various activities. Also looking at digital enablement and how are we uh, providing tools and technology so that uh, procurement can um, drive the best possible value for the business, for the bottom line and the top line. And then also finally looking at what we might call traditional effectiveness measures, such as the savings or and risk mitigation, supply assurance, uh, you know, that we commonly think of when we think about procurement value. The other uh, area of uh, performance that we look at when we consider digital world class is what we call operational excellence. And this is uh, looking at things like um, our efficiency and also the amount of automation we've been able to introduce to the business processes to drive sort of the, the, the best possible um, productivity with the, um, with the lowest possible expense and overhead cost. And so when we consider both of those uh, areas of performance, what we do with digital world class then is look at across all those dimensions, look at which companies, uh, procurement organizations are performing at the very highest levels. You'll see the, the blue square there. We also, of course, consider the uh, what peer groups are doing as well so that we have a comparison. And um, what we find is that most procurement organizations find themselves somewhere between peer and digital world class. Okay, I got a question for you. Elizabeth, how do you define the peer group? It's every other company that doesn't fall under as part of digital world class. So we want to make sure that we're looking at not just the top performers, right? But what are the those those uh, organizations that are um, still tracking their performance in similar ways, but maybe not quite achieving that highest uh, quartile of performance results? Yeah. Okay, good. I, I think that one of the things that's important is to understand is if you go back to the previous slide elizabeth mm -hmm. as you look at these organizations i think a lot of companies you know as they look at obviously the majority of organizations are not digital world class that tends to represent you know let's just say a, a, a round number around 10 percent of the overall database of organizations that have participated in this type of benchmarking very formal types of benchmarking and so what you find is, is, is the majority of organizations are outside of that. And I think one of the things to look at here is as you look at this, and Elizabeth explained you know, the idea of these business value and, and, and the operational excellence on these two dimensions of this overall matrix itself. And so you do have some organizations in here, uh, we call them operational excellence leaders that do very well in terms of how they operate. In some ways, you could define that as an efficiency of their organization. So they're very efficient. They're very operationally you know, excellent in what they do, but they may not necessarily be creating the level of value that they need to for their organization or potentially could do. And that's when we start looking at the value leaders as well. I think one of the things that we will highlight as we go through this, Elizabeth and I, it's not just the performance differences between these organizations, those that are in that upper right-hand blue box, the digital world-class organizations, and those that are outside of it. But what's more important is, what are those organizations doing in that blue box that allows them to have this level of performance within their organization? 
Yeah, it, it's a great point, Chris. There's clearly an advantage for the, that those blue, um, those companies in the blue box are achieving and, and for their organizations. But there are also some practices that they've taken on that uh, definitely are allow them to uh, excel at their uh, performance. So um, talking, um, you know, thinking about the advantages that we find that um, these uh, digital world-class procurement organizations enjoy and can provide to their enterprises. First, I want to look at business value, and I think it's really clear as you start to look through effectiveness, experience, and enablement that these organizations are truly um, uh, able to derive excellent amounts of value compared to the, the peer companies. And so I um, wanted to talk a little bit about those comparisons. In looking at effectiveness, what we find is that digital world-class procurement teams uh, are actually driving 96% higher spend cost reduction savings. Um, they're um, finding that 55% less of the savings that they are achieving is um, lost due to maverick buying or non-compliance with contracts. Uh, and so there's less erosion of the value that they're providing to the business. They're finding that they have four times uh, higher operational cost benefits. So when they invest um, in operations, they're, they're getting four times higher value. And they're also um, finding that they have 73% fewer suppliers that they're managing per, um, as if we look at that as a percentage of spend or per, per spend dollars. And the, you know that those are all very uh, interesting metrics. Maybe you know when we talk about um, the traditional effectiveness is always going to be cost savings but there's definitely it's important to look at the different dimensions that these procurement organizations are performing along so and you know i talked a couple minutes ago about experience stakeholder experience is becoming more and more important for procurement organizations they're starting to track um, internal customer satisfaction and so when we ask or when we look at the performance across experience we also see uh, a much higher um, uh, d delivery of positive experience for stakeholders with digital world-class companies. And some of the differences we have here include things like there's uh, digital world-class procurement teams are twice as likely for um, internal customers to rate them as having exceeded their expectations. You know, one of those uh, customer satisfaction type of measures. Um, we also find that these organizations are 86% more likely to be viewed by those business stakeholders as value business partners. So they've achieved a certain level of, let's say, maybe trust. They're viewed as experts. They're, um, they're included in key conversations, perhaps strategic planning sessions by their stakeholders because they, they bring a certain level of value um, and they have been able to take advantage of that that position that role to assure that their um, their stakeholders have the most positive experience with them and, and see them as that sort of internal uh, consultant or internal expert and then finally we when we look at experience we also see that um, 36 percent more digital world-class organizations uh, are, achieve, are achieving um, maybe more optimal uh, procure to pay process flows. And so you think about those as perhaps being automated, um, perhaps they're running more quickly, perhaps they, they have fewer errors. Um, and so the, the process itself is running more smoothly and that's very important. And then finally, the, the third dimension that we look at when we think about business value is enablement. I mentioned a few minutes ago that, you know, looking at technology and, and the, the, the uh, value that that can drive for the business is also important. It's, one of the most important areas that we find for digital world class um, is that they are uh, these organizations are continually in, continually investing in their technology and their tech and digital enablement. Um, and so uh, a couple uh, measures that we were able to show here, as you can see, um, digital world class uh, procurement teams have a seven times higher usage of e-auctions. And obviously, e-auctions are uh, tech, techno technologically enabled. Um, and then they're also three times more likely to uh, utilize some type of knowledge management environment to make sure that as their teams are building skills and building uh, capabilities and insights, that they're able to capture those and then disseminate those back out to the organization in an effective way. And so, um, you know, as you can see, there, it's very clear that when it comes to business value, digital world class companies are uh, really driving much greater uh, performance across many different areas in business value. And what 
important point that you've made here, Elizabeth, and I just want to make sure that everyone is fully understanding what we're highlighting here, is that what Elizabeth did under the effectiveness is really define what is a digital world class? What does it mean to be digital world class? And some organizations may sit there and say, well, I'm not sure if I'm really that, but do I want to be digital world class? Well, the, the, to answer that question is, do you want to be driving 96% higher spend cost savings to your organization than an average organization? If the answer is yes, then the question then becomes is how do I go about doing that? And I think this particular slide shows both. Not only what it looks like to be digital world class, it shows the performance differences, but it also shows you a little bit about the how. If I wanna drive 96% higher spend cost reduction savings, one of the insights on this particular slide is at the bottom. And Elizabeth highlighted the fact that these digital world-class organizations utilize electronic auctions seven times greater than the non-digital world-class organizations. And that's one of the techniques that they're utilizing. One of the practices happens to be a technology practice that they're utilizing to drive that kind of differentiation in their performance as an organization. And I think that's really what we're trying to explore and share with you all today is not just to understand that digital world class does matter. The performance differences are significant, but at the same time, help to understand what are some of the practices that are allowing these organizations to achieve that level of performance differentiation. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, you know, it, we can talk all day about the, the results, but you're right. It's really critical to look and understand how these organizations are achieving. And so thank you for pointing that out. You know, we uh, wanted to also talk a little bit about operational excellence, since that's the other aspect of performance that makes up the digital world class designation. And so for operational uh, excellence, we really look at, two, as I said a few minutes ago, two key areas, efficiency and then automation. And efficiency, you know, think of this as um, the how well we're doing with the amount of um, headcount, the amount of workload that's taken on, um, and the maybe the budget that's allocated to um, the, these procurement activities. And again, we find that digital world-class organizations are delivering much superior results to their peer, um, over their peer organizations. And so we're just looking at four key metrics for efficiency. Um, we, what we find is that about uh, half as much, um, much time is spent on the requisition to PO cycle time. And that's obviously um, for, that's for purchases that don't require bidding. And that's really important because if you can deliver faster turnaround times on things like rec to PO, then your uh, stakeholders are obviously going to be um, happier. So there's, there's a tie in there. We also find that there's um, digital world-class companies uh, drive about, 76% lower process cost per order that they um, that their organizations are issuing, and so you know that's that's definitely uh, looking at budget and um, bottom line results. There's a 42% lower process cost per item or supplier update when the these organizations are going through um, supplier data management, and so that's a, another key area that where they're driving lower costs. And then finally. You know, um, there. What we're finding is overall that digital world-class companies have about a 17% shorter cycle time when they're going through sourcing and sourcing events. And again, you know, those types of uh, turnaround times where they're performing better than peers is obviously um, going to allow them to do more, but it's also going to allow for their internal stakeholders to have maybe a better experience with the overall process. Yeah, and, you, and Elizabeth, you and I, I mean, you know all the clients and companies that we deal with and the importance of velocity today. You know, some of the measures that you're you're talking about here, as you, as you highlighted, these are efficiency. So you have cost, you have productivity, but you have speed and velocity as well. And that speed and velocity, you know, ensuring that we as procurement professionals are keeping up with the ever increasing cadence, the, the speed of our businesses becomes very, very important. 
um, what we understand as, as, as business leaders is that speed is becoming more and more of a differentiator between companies. And so how can we go do that and enable that through what we do in sourcing, procurement, and all of the processes that we have as an organization? So these become very important to consider what these world-class organizations or digital world-class organizations are doing that they have the speed, they have the cost, they have the value that far exceeds what we see in everybody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And the, that efficiency is um, important because to, well, to your point, uh, procurement organizations are being expected to do more and do more quickly. We're also seeing procurement organizations take on greater responsibility across maybe non, non-traditional areas such as expanding uh, sustain, sustainability in the supply chain and supplier diversity taking on more regulatory and compliance requirements, looking at third party risk management. You know, all of these are areas that procurement is now being expected to take a lead role to support the, the, or the business, um, while at the same time, making sure that our inter- internal stakeholders are also um, having a good experience and, and feeling like they're, um, there's a, agility perhaps, and even uh, quick response times from uh, their procurement um, services. And so, right, driving that efficiency is really, really critical to um, to all across all of those different areas. Um, and then, of course, with next to that is you know the the amount of automation that procurement organizations are able to add to 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 their businesses. So taking on the the digital tools and technology that can really also um, streamline the, the process is also important. And so, you know, looking at those measures, digital world class companies, as you can see. Um, have uh, uh, just over 25% greater requisition uh, transactions that are processed electronically. So, you know, obviously that's going to drive greater uh, speed. They're also, we're seeing 80, an 18% higher amount of automated um, dissemination of purchase orders to suppliers. So those suppliers are getting those purchase orders more quickly, um, and that's also going to drive speed. And then finally, we're seeing about uh, 1.7 times greater integration of procurement's um, key applications with uh, other procurement functional applications. And that's really looking at, you know, all the different uh, activities that are supported by technology. So a, a procure to pay system, perhaps a sourcing system, a contract lifecycle management system. We're finding is that digital world-class companies have been able to architect these systems so that they are more fluid across each other and that there's less, um, less sense of uh, uh, single point solutions that there's more ability for these systems to talk to each other to share data and therefore to uh, conduct those activities more quickly and that's obviously going to also be driving efficiency and timing. I I wanted to just highlight one thing Elizabeth that in, in, in one of the things you see on this chart is that Elizabeth highlighted these efficiency gaps between the digital world class and everybody else. But what she's highlighted on the bottom is automation. You know, one of the things that she highlighted on the first slide is the idea of digital world-class organizations. And if we went back and being one of those individuals that has been around Hackett for quite some time, I was around when we didn't talk about digital world-class. We were defining the top performers, those that were most efficient and most effective as being world-class performers. What we have seen over the last five years or so is the outsized impact that technology is having on the performance, not just in supply management and procurement, but on our enterprises as organizations. And I think as you go forward, you're going to see more and more of this. Elizabeth highlighted several different examples of automation and how technology is having this impact on the ability to achieve this level of performance, the level of performance that's defined by these digital world-class organizations. And we're gonna see more and more of that. Today, what are we seeing today? I mean, it's all about generative AI. So you're seeing technology permeate all the things that we go do, certainly having an impact on the way that we execute processes. But as we look forward, technology having a much more impact on the way that we conduct knowledge-based types of activities as well. Yeah, no, that's great. And Chris, uh, you know, I'll just share that when we talk to clients, and we're, you know, Chris and I talk to um, procurement leaders all day long, AI is definitely at the top of everyone's mind. And so, you know, I, you know 
Well, I don't like to call it all the hype all the time because it's you know, it's out there. We know it's going to have a sin, substantial impact on us. Most organizations today are just trying to do the exploratory work to understand how will these technologies impact what we do today. But I think more importantly, what capabilities will it give us that we don't do today and, 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 and just really don't have the ability to do? I think that's some of the very interesting things that technology like generative AI are going to have from an impact standpoint on us as organizations. Yeah, those use cases are definitely in the process of being developed. But I, and, but I just want to go back to also to just um, what you, I think you and I both touched on a little bit, which is what we truly see and, and the reason why these automation metrics you know, are, are higher with digital world-class companies is that they are investing in technology. They're investing in um, not just sort of the basics, but they are looking at new ways um, to apply things like AI uh, or machine learning um, to be able to um, drive better efficiency. And one of the um, one of the key things that we'll look at in a few minutes is, you know, what what that has that meant for um, headcount and and then uh, the workforce that these organizations are also managing. Yeah. So uh, obviously one of the critical measures that we look at when we talk about procurement and we can't avoid talking about is cost savings. And that's always going to be sort of the foundational way that organizations, the procurement teams are being measured and that organizations measure procurement, right? There's, it's not always the most important measure of value that a procurement organization can drive, but it's certainly the most, one of the most consistent things that, that we, uh, measures that we look at. And so when, when we look at cost savings and for Hackett, the definition of cost savings is the combination of cost reduction, so the actual price uh, uh, decreases, um, plus cost avoidance, where uh, procurement teams were able to uh, take a price that reflects the, um, the, the a lower than original offer, or were able to help work with the organization to um, reduce spend because they are optimizing either demand or specifications or in some other way achieving um, a reduction in overall spend cost. Um, and so, you know, obviously, as we've already shared, digital world-class uh, procurement organizations are definitely delivering much higher cost savings, well, even when we look at cost reduction and cost of wins together. As you can see, over time, that um, amount has increased and the differential between uh, digital world class and their peer companies has also increased. Um, so you can see we've shown the trend line here where digital world class companies have increased their cost savings by about 33% from 2016 until just 2023. Um, but peer companies have, while they have increased their cost savings as a percentage of spend, it's not been at the same amount. So they've increased it by about 17%. And you know, again, I think that when we when we talk about the di digital world class advantage, you know, we can't get away from um, from these kind of uh, metrics. These are really important. And to Chris's point, if your procurement organization wants to be achieving greater cost savings, then looking at what digital world class organizations are doing is obviously going to be uh, really important. And you know, I think. One of the other things to consider here is that when you look at the increase in the cost savings and the cost avoidances over this period of time, is that understanding from an economic standpoint, we've experienced some fairly significant inflationary pressures over the last several years. And what you're seeing are organizations in supply management delivering in the face of those headwinds, still delivering increase reduction and avoidance types of savings back to their organizations. Now, the one thing that we find is different, and we don't have this kind of granularity on this slide, but one of the things that we will explore over time is looking at the percentage. When you look at the total cost savings, that's defined by the, the, the summation of cost reduction and cost avoidance, those have a certain percentage of making up that total cost savings. What we tend to find that in inflationary types of environments, that cost avoidance has a higher percentage, makes up a higher percentage of overall cost savings than what we see in deflationary kind of environments. We're now quickly moving into more of a deflationary environment. 
we're finding that the PPI as well as the CPI indexes have been trending downwards. And that's a good thing, uh, for especially comparatively to what we were experiencing just six months ago. And so what you're finding is that more and more organizations are driving more focused on the cost reduction than the avoidance right now. So we're starting to see that be much more dominant in the total package of cost savings within their organizations. And I think, Laurie, you just raised your hand. I'm assuming you have a, a question from uh, the folks that are in the audience today. Yes. So uh, I have a question. Generally, how long does it take for a company to see the results kick in after implementation of technologies, considering change management, adoption, and knowledge curves on using new systems? I, I'm going to give my perspective and then I'll let Elizabeth, um, you know, make a comment. There's a number of different factors and I know nobody ever likes to hear this. Well, you know, it depends. And, you know, part of it depends on the type of technology. There are technologies that the adoption is, is more immediate in terms of their ability to utilize those types of technologies. You know, I would say some of the, if you look at purchase to pay systems, you know, implementing and, and, and automating that entire, you know, buy process, you know, the whole receiving process, the invoicing process, et cetera, and that whole entire purchase to pay process, those become very difficult to implement. Um, and, and, and that complexity is driven based on the, the geographical expanse of that organization, how many countries does it have to be implemented in, et cetera. And, and so it takes time for that to be adopted by the organizations. Uh, there's a lot of change management that has to occur because the individuals, the users of that system are not necessarily the procurement organization. So the change management has to occur across the entire organization. And, and, and so this can take some time to realize the benefits of those solutions. And the benefits of the, you know, these purchase to pay solutions you know, tend to be certainly cost and velocity and accuracy of, of those transactions that are occurring but it's also a receptacle and a, and a way to collect a lot of data that can be used in other ways by the organization. If you compare that to say an e-sourcing solution, an electronic sourcing type of solution that would have a big impact on the chart that you're seeing in front of you right now, those for the most part are consumed and utilized by the procurement professionals themselves. So the adoption of these technologies is much more quick you know, in those types of environments. So, you know, you tend to find that the adoption and then the realization of utilizing the value from them is much more quickly because you have a much smaller population of, I would say a much more controlled population of individuals that are actually utilizing that type of technology. It's hard to put a figure, but I would say that, you know, if I was out there and I was using a solution like an e-sourcing solution, uh, even category management solutions that are today, the impact is much more immediate uh, on those organizations because there's a process and a velocity. You know, one of the things I was saying before, it's not just that we get better results. So we go out and we participate and intervene in a particular marketplace. And, and as we go out there, you want to you know, derive the most value possible uh, for your organization, depending on how you participate in that particular market as possible. So there's the, the way that you execute. But also, if you want to drive more value to your organization, your ability to execute across many different areas and, and go after more areas is a driver of your total value as an organization. So the speed by which you do it, the cycle time, becomes very important as well to improve that productivity. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I'll just add that um, what we find with digital world class organizations or any procurement organization, what we always want them to think about is that technology is is a long game, right? You're, you're not just adopting some technology today and then moving on. And so um, looking at uh, the value that you get out of technology is not just a, a, a you know a snapshot in time. You're, you're wanting to continue to see technology as being a key driver of even greater value. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's really important to think of maybe technology as being on a roadmap or being a journey that you're taking. Um, but yeah, and to Chris's point, we definitely see 
when procurement is the main user of a technology, uh, the value uh, uh, happens seems to happen more quickly than when there's a broader audience of users. Thanks, Chris, for that. Um, yeah, and so now we, we wanted to look a little bit at now highlight some other elements of uh, digital world class performance. One of those that we talked about earlier was uh, total procurement costs and um, what procurement organizations are uh, uh, spending in terms of the digital world class versus the peer groups. When, uh, for Hackett, when we look at procurement costs, we look at four key elements of expense. We look at the actual labor, um, any outsourcing uh, or paying to third parties um, expenses, the technology that we're investing in, and then other expenses that might be things like overhead or training. Um, and so what we find, as you can imagine, and I think we've already touched on this, is that uh, digital world-class companies, for the most part, <coughs> are, um, are much lower than their peers. And when it comes to looking at cost as a percentage of spend, um, and then what you also see and what we wanted to make sure we pointed out on this chart, this, the trend line, is that over time from 2014 to 2022, uh, procurement costs for both digital world class and peer organizations have been decreasing. Um, as you can see, uh, in both cases in very similar, almost parallel fashion, uh, but digital world class companies have been decreasing their cost by about 9% a year and peer companies have been decreasing their cost by about 11% a year. However, that all changed in 2023 um, when in both company, in both sets of companies and across our entire um, database, what we found is that um, procurement costs were going up on average about 6% um, for um, between 2022 and 2023. Um, of course, there's going to be multiple reasons for this. And Chris, do you want to go into what we found has been some of those reasons anyway for yeah. that cost increases? Yeah, it was, it's very interesting because, as Elizabeth mentioned, you can look at this long period of trend, and what we've always found is this, this drive for more efficiency. You know, it's, it's the old adage, you know, how can I do more for less? And, and for so long, we're finding that these top performing organizations were continuing to be able to drive higher value. If you, you remember from the previous slide, we talked about spend savings. One of the most prolific sources of value that comes out of a supply management and a procurement organization. It's not the only value, but it is a, a very commonly and, and very dominant form of value that it does create. And you saw the trend line going up over a period of time. What you're seeing here is a trend line going down. And so in many ways, you would look at the ROI, the return on investment of these organizations. If you were to take the cost savings divided by the cost of the function itself, the labor, the outsourcing, the technology, and other expenses of these organizations, you would find that that ROI continued to expand over this period of time until recently. And, and so the question is, well, why is that? Well, one of the things that we mentioned earlier was some of the inflationary effects that we've had in the marketplace. And those inflationary effects have certainly had an impact on the labor component of the overall cost of procurement. One of the things that you don't see here from a granularity and detail standpoint is how much is labor as you think about the cost of a procurement organization. And if we went back over the last 20 years, labor has always been the most significant component of cost when you think about the overall cost of a procurement capability a function typically it would rate you know would, you know somewhere in the 80 percent if we went back you know many years ago to you know 50 to 60 percent today what's happening you know during that period of time was a number of different things that have caused that change to occur one of the biggest is the labor for technology swap that is occurring within organizations so when we look at these digital world-class organizations how are they able to drive, not only be more efficient in terms of their overall cost as a function, what they invest in performing for procurement organizations, but at the same time, being lower cost and driving more value back to their organization. And one of the things that they're doing is they're much more dependent on technology. And so what you've seen is those organizations over a period of time have, have, have re-architected the way that they, the cost structure of their organization, where they have swapped out labor costs for technology investments within their organization. 
And in a lot of ways, what that's also allowed them to do is to reposition where those that labor is actually spending its time. And, and when you look at that, you know, what you find in these digital world-class organizations, those individuals, the professionals in the sourcing and procurement professionals in those organizations are spending a much higher percentage of their time on more what we would consider to be more strategic types of activities, architecting a supply base, you know, reducing risk within the entire supply network itself. This is where they're spending their time versus on some of the more transactional activities um, you know, that they were potentially doing before. And this has been happening over a long period of time. It's not new, but we continue to see those trends occur and it's certainly emanating and, and being shown in the data that we have as well. Yeah, and along those same lines, Chris, you know, when we look at um, FTE count, you know, we're, we've seen a similar uh, maybe trend, right? We've seen FTE count, when we look at full-time equivalents, and that's uh, as a percentage of spend, you know, we, again, digital world-class companies have fewer uh, resources, so it's very interesting there. These resources are have greater efficiency, but it means a higher ROI when they do create greater savings, um, but they, they accomplish greater performance with fewer FTEs. But what, you know, obviously we track for both digital world class and peer for the past four years. We saw, uh, again, a significant decline. Digital world class teams, FTEs were falling by about 13% for those four years. During the same period, peer companies even dropped their um, uh, full time equivalent count by almost 12%. And then again, there was a change from 2022 to 2023 when we saw that. Uh, headcount was increasing by about 1% for digital world-class companies and about 2.7% for their peers. So yeah, there's definitely been a change when we consider the past, um, sorry, the previous uh, trend and then also this trend, the cost and the full-time equivalents. So we're seeing, you know, a, a slight uptick. We're going to keep an eye on this because it is, as you said, it is bucking the, the former uh, very long-held trends of over time of um, resources and cost going down. Any any additional insights you, you can uh, talk about here, Chris? I, I think the one that maybe a lot of folks are asking themselves is, do I really want to be part of a digital world class organization? They're less costly. You know, what's that? I mean, I, I don't want to work for an organization that is not paying their folks. Maybe the salaries are lower as well. Well, that's the opposite of what's happening. What you're finding is, yes, they are driving their costs down in terms of how they operate. The individuals in those organizations are doing what I would consider to be much more strategic type of work and even new work, especially as we start thinking about the impact of generative AI and what possibilities that have for procurement professionals on a go forward basis. But the other thing that we're seeing is that these organizations actually their wages, their salaries uh, of their professionals are higher than what we see in the non digital world class organizations. So they're not reducing it through salary reductions. What they're doing it is through improved productivity. Yeah, and I think that that's the good news, right? I think it's very easy to look here and say, oh, the, these organizations are achieving great performance because they're cutting costs somewhere else. And that is not the case. Digital world class organizations are investing in their resources. I think they, I know they're spending more, um, dollars per year on training. They're obviously spending um, more on and, and looking at things like career path development for their teams. They're, uh, they're constantly looking at organizational structure and workload. And to your point that you made a few minutes ago, what we find is digital world-class organizations also um, look at the, the, their resource allocation. And what we find is that they are um, over some of the uh, four key um, activity areas they are focusing more on higher value um, air, uh, activities that you just mentioned, being more strategic. So as you can see here, what we do is compare peer to digital world class and we ask how they allocate the time of all their resources on average. And when you think of on the left side of the spectrum here, ordering and PO management may be seen as more tactical. For sure, uh, we can uh, procurement has a, a much lower chance of adding value on those kind of activities. Uh, we look at function and strategy and performance management um, as well. But then when we think about um, looking at more maybe advanced areas like uh, strategic category management, 
supplier relationship management where we really can start to um, activate the, the power that um, the, a more strategic approach to procurement can provide. Um, we do see that digital world-class companies are uh, able to allow those resources to spend more time in those key areas, like you just said, Chris. Yeah, and, and I think this answers one of those key questions you know, we always get is, you know, as Elizabeth shared earlier, is what does it mean to be digital world-class? And we're showing a, a, just a small snapshot of what some of those performance measures are and what some of those differences are. There's many, many differences. And, and, and you define a digital world-class organization you know, as you know, those that are able to deliver more value and they're able to do it in a much more efficient way. And then what you want to understand is how are they able to do that? And I think this answers one of those questions of the how. They allocate their resources differently than everybody else. So you say, well, how do they drive 90%, 95% higher spend cost savings? How do they drive a more, you know, a lower cost in terms of the overall cost of their function as well? Well, again, you know, this is one of those ways. So as you consider and even ask yourself, you know, do I want being digital world class to be one of my objectives? as an organization? If the answer is yes, then what this shows is that these are some of the things that you have to start to look at and consider making changes in your organizations to allow for that to happen. And, and Lori, I know you just raised your hand and I think you might have a question for us. <laughs> yeah, so the question is, are some industries more mature and their ability to be digital world class compared to other industries. I, I'll take a first pass at this, and it's a question that we get quite commonly. And one of the ways that we'll do is, you know, we'll take those two peer groups. So, for example, you can take the digital world class peer group. You know, that set of organizations that tends to represent anywhere from eight to ten percent of our database and compare that to the demographics of the non-digital world-class organizations, which we're characterizing as the peer group in these slides. And, and you look at that, what you find is, yeah, there are some differences uh, between them. You may, and we look at it across the, a lot of different areas. Uh, we'll look at, you know, what industries are represented in both of those different populations. You know, are there certain industries that tend to be more higher performers than others? Uh, we'll look at, you know, size of companies, you know, do the digital world class organizations tend to be larger companies versus not? Um, we will look at a number of different characteristics as we look at both of those. And what I will say is that if I look at it over a longer period of time, what we find are similarities between the demographics of both of those populations. Um, they're more similar than they are different. You know, and one of the reasons for that is if you go into any particular industry, people say, well, there's got to be a certain industry that always, that's much better than everybody else. And I'll make a few comments on that. You know, but when you go into a particular industry and you say, all right, I'm going to pick X industry, let's say technology, you may find that the median within that industry is, is higher in terms of their performance versus other industries. But what you'll find within that industry is a wide variation of the performance. So it's not saying that just because you're in that industry that you're doing well. What we find is not necessarily the industries themselves and the unique characteristics, things that they don't control that allow them to be better. It is the overall, it really comes down, the biggest differences is those individual companies in terms of what are they doing to adopt some of these practices in terms of driving this better performance, the adoption of technology, et cetera. Now, what I will say, we do see some higher instances of that in some industries. There's an old thing I used to say is that, you know, you know, if you wanna see the best performing organizations, look for those industries that have the thinnest margins because they have to be good, right? Those industries that have very big, you know, protected margins, um, in some ways, they don't have to be as good. They don't, they don't have that pressure on them like an organization that's in a highly competitive industry. So we do see, do see some differences there. But I would say there's a lot of more individual differences between companies within an industry than it is 
aligned to certain industries do very well. You know, one other difference that we see, Chris, is often if a company is in high growth mode, if they've launched a new product or new products, they're maybe in an emerging technology, they're um, oftentimes procurement is called upon to support that growth. Maybe they're opening new businesses, they're opening new markets, they're setting up new facilities. And so their, their procurement team is not as focused on um, maybe cost savings, for example, as they would be on building uh, volume and capacity for the business to be able to support its growth. So uh, creating, uh, developing new supply base um, and that kind of thing. So it's definitely is um, not in industry independent, dependent, but um, within the industry, there could be um, like more of a, a, a leaning towards a, a, a big growth um, area. And as a result, the digital world-class performance doesn't look the same. Yeah, and that's a great point because at the end of the day, we in supply management and procurement, our main role is to enable business success. And I think Elizabeth highlighted a great example in this particular organization. One of the major drivers of business success is, is time to market. You know, how do we go and bring new products to market in a much more quicker way? So how can we in supply management enable that to occur? And so it becomes a velocity, a cycle time kind of area. It doesn't mean that cost isn't important, but as we see the maturation in some of these very advanced organizations, what you find is that their value propositions to their organizations can be much more broad. Um, it includes the cost savings, but it also includes you know, things to support new product introduction processes within the business. It includes you know, de-risking the overall supply network, you know, ensuring continuity of supply in a very new and unique architected way in terms of how they architect their entire supply network, not just at the tier one level, but multi-tier as well. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and, and I think that you said it earlier, Chris, you know, um, it's, there may, it may be that uh, a procurement organization says while we want to improve performance our goal is not to become necessarily digital world class we just want to make those incremental um, performance uh, increases so that we can enjoy greater um, stakeholder experiences or so that we can you know help the business have uh, meet its its maybe goals or for growth or for um, profit margin um, improvements and so you know really every individual procurement organization needs to decide where you know what what their main focus is going to be but understanding i think it, what's important is that digital this digital world class performance is aspirational probably and should be for every procurement organization because we can always get better so i just want to uh take a time check and make sure we have time for any questions yeah if anybody Let's, has any uh, questions you can type them in now yeah, I would just encourage anybody that's uh, you know on the session, if there are questions that you have, just type them into the chat. Uh, Elizabeth and I can review that and answer any of those types of questions that you might have. You know, I, you know, I, in, in many ways, as you're looking at this information, you know, this was a, a I would call it a bit of a peek into this performance, a, a bit of a peek into performance measures. You, you're not seeing us utilize a lot of the the actual metrics themselves. And you know, part of the reason is, is that we're, we really wanted to expose some of the trends that we're seeing uh, in organizations. And you know, what, is, what is happening and what is happening overall? You know, one of the advantages that we have here at the Hacker Group is that this isn't a one-time study. It, 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 you might be surprised, but we've been benchmarking procurement organizations for over 30 years. It's been a long time. Now, we're not using the data from 30 years ago or even 10 years ago or even five years ago, but it does give us a, a unique you know, perspective where we can look at things over longer periods of time to see some of the trends you know, that we are seeing. In some ways, we can use those trends to help project what we believe is going to happen in the future as well. And that becomes some of the research that we do as organizations. Certainly, there's, as, as we look at this performance, it informs us uh, certainly informs us in terms of what those best performers are doing and, and our and it gives us the opportunity as we see these unique insights is to share them 
with all of our clients and share those insights that others can adopt those same type of practices in terms of what they're doing as well. I got one question. Yeah. So the, que the question is, if I wanted to know how my company compares to digital world class, how would I go about doing that? Well, I think there's there's different ways to go do that. And, you know, part of it is, you know, as organizations, you know, want to look at that. And in, in many ways, it's like going to the doctor. Um, I actually had the opportunity, or I call it, you know, I'll call it an opportunity to go to the doctors earlier this week uh, for my annual checkup. And, and so what a lot of organizations will use is, is use benchmarking as a way as a, as a checkup for them. And, and so in that way, they're compared against digital world-class organizations. You know, organizations will do benchmarking with Hackett. And, and one of the ways that we do is we'll compare them against digital world-class organizations. So they'll provide their information and then we'll, we'll, we'll actually compare that to, you know, what digital world class is, as well as a, a set of peer companies as well. And, and so they had these two different reference points to say, you know, you know, as I look at where I am today, how do I compare not only against my peers in my industry, but how do I compare against these top performing organizations, these digital world class organizations that are digital world class? It's not based on their industry. It's not based on anything. It's just they are only digital world class because they are the best performers. And in many ways, that digital world class becomes potentially an aspirational target, um, but it also can be one, depending on how well you're performing, you know, one that's, you know, maybe there's a smaller gap. But, it, you know, in many ways that you can go through a formal benchmarking exercise or one way, you know, and, you know, certainly there's a relationship that many of you are, customers of, of Barreau. And, uh, you know, through that relationship, there's opportunities to get access to the digital world-class metrics uh, to compare yourself. The one thing I will tell you is that, you know, having a metric um, is you have to understand first how you define it. You know, so there's, there's opportunities, you know, cost of procurement, you know, Elizabeth shared some, some key measures. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we did go through is the actual definitions of them. You know, one, one of the ones was the cost of procurement of the function itself. And it can be very, you know, difficult to determine what that is. Lori. So I have a couple more questions. One okay. is, um, can you share any details on who you are seeing as leading the way in this transformation? Can you share any company names or if not, then what industries are leading the charge? I, I can't share industry na or company names, and it is probably most people can imagine. We work with hundreds and hundreds of different organizations. We benchmark them, and the performance information that we gather of any individual company is is confidential. Um, okay. You know, the only thing I will say is that in some cases, those companies publicly highlight their performance, and in those cases, we can highlight who some of those companies are. But some of the industries, I mean, certainly, you know, that one of the industries that we have seen for long periods of time that have performed quite well, uh, CPG is, is, is done. Uh, we've seen certainly, you know, higher performance in industries like, you know, high tech. Um, and, 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 you know, it depends on the organization there because I, I have to be very careful um, because you have some organizations there that, as I mentioned before, one of the key drivers is the size of their margins. Uh, I'm not saying it's the only critical but we do t tend to find a correlation between higher margins and lower performance. And when those margin pressures become more uh, of a focus of the organization, and cost becomes more of a focus of the organization, you tend to find you know, the, the, the more investments in supply management and procurement and a maturation of the function itself. Okay, so um, we're up against our hour. Thank mm -hmm. you everybody for joining. And if you have any questions or want some follow-up, here's my contact information. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.